Welcome back to Material Atomics. We have done a bunch of videos about the nature of a material atom, and today we're going to do our first exploration on the nature of electricity. Because if the material atomics model is correct, then we have to have a material explanation for electricity. Yeah, in fact, electricity has very much to do with how we arrived at our particular structure of the atom in general, because We've talked a lot about how these filaments that we propose are the in proper interpretation of the radial distribution function, which comes down to an extrapolation of the shape of the surface of the atom, which is gauged by where the electron can be found. And so moving back from long range effects, we're gonna start today by thinking about electricity itself. And the way that we work our way towards this explanation for electricity is to go back to our model for the surface of the atom, which we initially deduced with the spin one-half concept. And when we were trying to solve this problem, we were essentially trying to come up with a physical motion of the surface of the atom that could reflect the particular SU2 symmetry of the electron. And that led us to this involuting toroid, which essentially can be thought to reflect the spherical nature of the 1s shell and has the ability to turn twice before the fiber at the surface of the atom is able to return to the equator. So we start there with this idea that the electron has spin one half, that the electron in the chemist sense represents the outer surface of the atom, and now we need to work our way towards electricity. And we know that electricity is not the flow of electrons because if you go into the literature, you very quickly discover that the speed at which current propagates through a circuit is much, much faster than the speed at which electrons flow through the circuit. So current propagates nearly at the speed of light, but electrons flow on the order of centimeters a second. And so this huge mismatch suggests that there has to be some other explanation for how you can close an electric circuit and immediately start to get uh, motive force pass th passing through it. When we speak of the electron as this dynamic description of the surface of the atom, what we slowly arrive at is that that surface motion seems to be continuous among the atoms in the chain of the conductor. And so what happens is when we take a really simple atom, although we can apply this to complex orbitals in a minute, when we take a really simple atom like this S shell that we've drawn here, when you put this S shell with its north pole facing the commensurate south pole of another shell. When you put them end to end. You put them end to end. When you put them end to end, you see that not only is the motion continuous across the two shells, but there's also an interesting engagement at the poles with these vortices that we specify through the spin one half motion, which we suggest could be important in the concept of electromagnetic attraction. So the correspondence between spin and charge is probably a topic for an entire video, which we definitely should do. But one thing that you do notice is when atoms have these unpaired spin electrons, the concept of charge becomes very important. You'll almost never find elemental atoms in this unpaired state. They're very, very rare and transient in nature. Almost immediately, the chemists would tell you that the atom picks up an electron and therefore becomes charged. Or it engages in some sort of bonding. It's somehow electrically active with these un unpaired spins. Well, like for example, like if you have oxygen, which has an unfilled valence orbital, you don't go out into the world and find a bunch of monatomic oxygen. When you go out into the world, what you find is you find diatomic oxygen. That's the ground state in which it exists. And so you don't have a condition where there's this loose unpaired electron that's rolling around. You have a natural tendency to equilibrate into a conformation that's much more stable. When they're in that unpaired state, like if you, have a, if you have a radical in nature, it's extremely reactive. So we understand that there is some correspondence between this concept of unpaired, let's say spin up alone electrons and 
electric activity. And I think we should unravel that in a different video because it's very subtle and very nuanced and it requires a great deal of investigation and we're still working out all the details. The take home is just that I believe that what we learn about the motion of the electron surface from the spin one half concept that we've produced allows us to come up with a model where the surface of the atoms is capable at least of generating a motive force which is both electrostatically engaging, attractive, and is also capable of conducting motion throughout all of the shells in the conductor, at least all of the ones that are in contact in this polar fashion. Thus, we have motive power at a distance very quickly while the actual speed of the shells, the electron motion, might be substantially less. So basically, if you imagine that you have an open circuit and you have your positive terminal and you have your negative terminal and there's a gap in between them, the uh, atoms that are connected to one another and to the, po let's say, the positive terminal of the battery are going to be spinning. It's a particular motion we happen to call spin, but sure. I think that's reasonable. So there is the, the wire that is connected to the terminal of the power source of the circuit is going to be experiencing some kind of motion that is informed by the power source. And the, the atoms that are attached to the power source are bound to one another. And so when they move, they move together as one. What you, what you end up having is you end up having what amounts to a solid object that is rotating as one in response to the impulse given to it by the power source. And You're just to clarify, we don't necessarily mean that every atom, its entire surface is engaged in this process. Sure. Some of the surfaces could be engaged in bonding yep. exclusively. We don't know how to untangle that exactly just yeah, yet. Yeah, like we, used to, we think about it in terms of like a single atom thick wire. In all reality, the metals of things like copper that you would typically find in a conductor have wildly complex orbital shapes. And perhaps only a few of those are actively engaged in the unified transmission of this vorticular motion. <laughs> like vorticular motion. And so it's a little bit of, if you take a spherical cow sort of approximation. Possibly, unless, unless, as I suspect, there is a spherical cow. Yeah, but I would assume that even a sphere, like the spherical atoms are pulsing into their other orbitals periodically, and so, and there's, there's got to be some kind of aspect of it that's yeah, involved in bonding. It's a simplification. It's a, it's a deep, deep oversimplification. <laughs> so like, we can agree on that. But, but I the think point, it's useful. It's useful. So the point is, is that you have this collection of atoms that are bound to one another. They're also bound to the power source, and the power source is giving them some kind of motion. This is what electricity is. It's the ability to move things. And so the wire connected to the power source is moving. And there's this other part of the circuit, which is the wire that isn't connected to the power source yet. And the minute that you bridge the gap between them... It's hard to disentangle who has more motion. All you know is there's a difference, which we call voltage. So the difference in the motion of the shells between the two is a voltage. So basically what's happening is that when you close the circuit, the circuit wants to equilibrate the motion that's in the positive terminal with the motion that's in the negative terminal. And because it can't do that across the electrical, uh, the electrochemical cell inside the battery, that's, that's, that's where the gradient is. It passes through the wire of the circuit in order to be able to bridge the gap with the least amount of effort possible. And so, it's the equilibration of that motion through the circuit that, that happens once you close the switch. And because both chains of atoms are approximated as solid objects, you're not getting a... There's not a, there's not a propagation time. or there's not a, it, The propagation time is very fast because it's a really stiff object. Stiff objects will propagate their motion faster than soft objects. Like if you imagine if you take like a piece of dental floss or something, and you're trying to propagate some kind of motion through it, that's going to be a lot harder, or f from end to end, that's going to be a lot harder than if you have a steel rod and you're rotating one end of it and the other end of it is rotating exactly at the same time. And that has to do with the stiffness because the atoms are held together more tightly. And so inside of a circuit, the motion as it wants to leave the positive terminal of the battery is held in check by there being a break in the circuit. You close the switch and then you create this 
stiff network that is able to propagate at nearly the speed of light a motion that was there at the beginning and wishes to be there at the end. Yeah, yeah, you're just syncing it up and dissipating all of that tension that's in those wires to begin with. I'd never thought of a battery as wanting to equilibrate in that way before. That's kind of a transformative way of seeing it for me. Yeah, I think it's kind of convenient to think about it as a gearbox. Uh, I don't understand cars. So yeah, so <laughs> in cars, you're just basically smashing two gears that are in a particular motion, a much more simple motion in this case, together. Mm. And you get you know, it's slowed down by the oil in the chamber and all of this, but honestly... You're getting motive force. You from get motive design. force, and if you start to incorporate in the fact that we're saying the shell of the atom has these protrusions everywhere, which we call filaments of the electron, they're the thinned portions represented in the electron distribution function, then there is variable action, particularly more engagement at close range interactions than at far, because, of course, you're sweeping out more volume closer uh, the more your radius shrinks, right? This is a square cube relationship. Let's do that in the next video. Let's do that in the next video. That's going to lead us into electromagnetism, where we'll bring back in the filaments. But why don't we just put a pin in it here with electricity today and say one more time that this is a very simple circuit, the most idealized simple circuit imaginable that we're showing you today. And it's going to be a lot of effort to actually build out bigger, more accurate models. And yeah, eventually we'll do full animations of this and we'll show you how solenoids fall out from this and we'll deal with magnetism very soon. Yep. So, yep. see you next time. Yep.